Monday to you, and welcome again to another episode of Monday Meditations. Clearly, we're not on the front porch, but we are having a great time of polishing the pulpit and hope and trust one day maybe you can be there as well. But we are wanting to meditate upon the Word of God. That's what we're here to do each Monday, and we're studying the book of Philippians. Today, we're going to be focusing on chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 11, and keeping in mind, running straight for the goal, and keeping focused on the goal. Paul was always goal-oriented, and we see that in his life. If you go back and think about this book was written while he was in prison, it, it carries a lot more weight when you hear phrases like this first part of chapter 3, verse 1. It says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, he continues to say to write the same things to you, to me indeed. It's not grievous, but for your for you it is safe. He's saying, in essence, for your sake it is safe. But this idea of rejoicing, he was in prison, most likely in Rome, under Nero. And that was a very challenging time, but he wasn't concerned about his circumstance as much as he was his position in Christ and the care and the position of the brethren there in Philippi. He, of course, as we've talked about in previous episodes, loved them and cared for them. But he says to them to write the same things, the things that I'm going to be writing to you about staying on course, staying focused on the goal, not letting the circumstances and situations get in the way. He said, this is not this is not something that's going to be grievous for me to write these things to you because it's for your own good. It's for your safety to help them to stay in the fight, to stay faithful to the Lord. He says in verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. King James Version is talking about the idea of mutilation. And that, of course, goes back to the circumcision that was found under the law of Moses. Many in the first century were still trying to bind that on Christians. And, of course, that had been taken away and nailed to the cross, Colossians 2, verse 14. He says, then in verse number 4, he says, verse number 3, rather, For we are of the circumcision, which is which work, worshiping God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, we're the circumcision. Again, that, that term is important because it goes back to the the Jews and how this was part of their covenant with God, they would be circumcised on the eighth day, as Paul will bring that up later on as well. It was a it was part of the covenant relationship that they were in with God. We're in a spiritual covenant relationship with God today. And that's what he's talking about here. We're the circumcision which worship God in spirit, just as Jesus commanded would be done, John chapter four, verse twenty three and twenty four. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And the hour has come. We are part of that kingdom if we're members of the Lord's church today. So he says, we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Many were trusting in their pedigree. They were trusting in their traditions and trusting in the things that have been passed on from generation to generation. He says, you want to talk about that? I can't. Look at verse 4. Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in flesh, I'm more. He goes on in verse 5, says, Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Circumcise the eighth day. That goes back to Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 3, where they were commanded on the eighth day to circumcise the flesh. It was part of the covenant of that relationship. You were born a Jew and taught that you were a Jew, born one of the chosen generation. We're taught today and become the spiritual Israel of God with the circumcision of the flesh, not the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart, that spiritual circumcision, cutting away, of course, the sin that's in our lives. But he says of the tribe of Benjamin, that, that would speak well to those Jews who, who knew their history because Benjamin was the first king came out of Benjamin. And of course, Saul, and that goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 9. And he was a Benjamin, Benjamite. That, that was a... Not one of the largest tribes, but definitely had a pedigree, definitely had a, a traditional history behind that that would stand out. A Hebrew of Hebrews. But then he said as touching the law, Pharisee. That's one of the highest levels that one could attain in the spiritual realm of, of Judaism as being one of the Sanhedrin specifically, but a Pharisee you, before you were a part of the Sanhedrin. And so this was, this was someone who knew the law. They didn't always, of course, practice it as they should. Jesus would often say, you do what they say, but not what they do. And many times they would follow the Mishnah more than they did the Torah and follow after the traditions that they had elevated up alongside the law. But he's speaking about, you want to talk about pedigree, I've got one. He goes on then in verse 6, and this is where not just the what he was born into, not just those things, it was also his attitude and his disposition, his zeal. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
There was no accusation that Judaism could bring against him that would stick. He was very zealous, so zealous that he was willing to put people to death even, or in prison at least. We remember he, as uh, Saul of Tarsus, he held the coats of those that stoned Stephen for preaching the gospel. He was very zealous, but his zeal was not according to knowledge. Remember Romans 10 talks about it. But then he says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, and they were gained physically speaking. No doubt Paul would have been, Saul of Tarsus would have been a wealthy man. No doubt he would have been a very... Uh, respected and revered man among the people. But he said, those things that were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. It was more important to have Christ. It was more important to be with Christ than to have those things. Continuing verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Very similar to the parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, about finding a treasure of great price, selling all that you have, or finding a pearl of great price, and finding all that you have as well. You, you sell all you have and then to purchase that thing. It's more valuable. Paul said, all these things that I have developed in my life, count them but dung, refuge, something to be cast out, not something to hold on to, that I may win Christ. He wanted to be with Christ, and he wanted them to be with Christ. Then he says in verse 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. He says these things that, if it's, it's all bound by law, if you do all the law, then you earn salvation. And that's not how this works. The law is there to protect us. The law is there to keep us from sin and show us what sin is. But... It's not about keeping the law perfectly. It's about being faithful to him. He says, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. The faith that comes from Christ Jesus. The faith that also teaches us what that law is and why it should be followed to the best of our ability. But not in a sense of I'm earning my salvation. Look, Lord, I did this. I did this. I did this. Therefore, you owe me that. That's not how this works. We have faith in Christ Jesus and what he has done for us. As we're here at Polishing the Pulpit, we just heard a lesson recently and as something that was brought up about the idea of what would Jesus do. It's more about what did Jesus do, not what would he do. He's already done and tells us what he will do and shows us what he has done and what he will do in his scripture. We need to follow that. Listen to what he has to say. No, this is, I, I can count all these things as refuge and put those things aside because of what Jesus has done for me and be found in him, not in my own righteousness. Um, all the righteousness that we do, Isaiah would say, is as filthy rags, and that's to be cast out as well. Verse 10 says, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. See, there's the application at the end of that. Look at what Jesus did, and here's what I can do as a response to that. Paul would say, Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's powerful. And then he says, closing out in verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul was living his life, as we know in his letter to Timothy, he was living his life in a hope and a confidence that when he drew his last breath, he was going to be with the Lord. Remember what he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there's, there is, not not there might be, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. And not to me only, but to all of them that love his appearing. You see, that's your responsibility in mine. He's shown us the greatest love that can be shown in his sacrifice. What are we willing to do for him? That's something on which we can meditate this Monday and every day. May God bless you too, immediately.